welcome. God, you're worthy and you're welcome. God, you're worthy and you're welcome here, God. You're welcome here, God. Hallelujah. You're welcome, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you. 
Because there is something called fitness in the kingdom. Praise God. And I want you to know also that God will never abandon his agenda to pursue your own emergencies. God will not abandon his own kingdom agendas to pursue your own emergencies, especially your matters arising through your anxieties and compromises. God's purpose today looks to have been hijacked by various forms of things, including religious forms. Things that look like God, that speak like God, but it's not God. The things men run after that look normal, it looks divine, it looks spiritual, it looks churchy, but it's not God. And sometimes, and unfortunately, many of us are satisfied with having these forms even when God is not in them. The Lord wants me to sound a cry this morning that the foundation of God still stands still. That there is still a door that grants people access into the kingdom of God. There is a door. The kingdom of God has an entry point. The kingdom of God has an entry point. There is a door. Jesus himself stood and said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He said, I am the door of the sheepfold. The no one that comes, and those who came before me, they were thieves and robbers. There's only one way to this sheepfold. There is only one way to this kingdom. Even though in the kingdom, there are many doors. But there is only one door into the kingdom. There is only one way, only one door that determines whether you are in or you are out. Praise God forevermore. Hallelujah. If you enter a big compound that has a main entrance and then that has another door. You can be through the main gate and still be outside. Is that correct? But I say door that determines whether you are inside or you are outside. is the main entrance. Praise God forevermore. Amen. With this door, you are either in or you are out. You cannot be in and out. Many of us need to examine ourselves today and ask yourself, are you in or are you out? If you are in and out, and it feels like with your life, it seems like you are in and out, you are in the wrong place. And it's not too late right now to find your way in to the kingdom. In John chapter 3, verse 3, the popular scripture of the Bible says, Unless a man be born again, he cannot see or enter the kingdom of God. He said, Unless a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Somebody tell yourself there is a kingdom to enter. This is not the only place you see Jesus use the expression of entry. You remember the parables of the ten virgins? Five were foolish, five were wise. There was an entrance. Once the bridegroom came, those who were ready, the Bible says, went in. And those who were not ready, when they came, they knocked on the door, but it was, the door was shut because the bridegroom already shut the door. They were so close, yeah, they didn't make it. They were there, they were there, but they didn't get in. Today, I want to speak to those who are almost there, but they are not there. I want to speak to those who are close, but they are not in, that you carry the greatest loss. You are so close. And you should not have that loss recorded against you. Because you are so close, you almost made it. You are at the door, but God doesn't want you to stay by the door. He doesn't want you to stay at the corridor of the kingdom. He wants you to come into the kingdom. So in John chapter 3, verse 3, Nicodemus came to Jesus and asked a question. Unfortunately, many of us have been telling him he asked the question he didn't ask. Nicodemus did not say, what must I do to be saved? He said, you are a teacher come from God. And no man does the work that you do unless God is with him. By this, Nicodemus referenced the miracles of Jesus. Jesus himself said that when he, he said, if I, by the finger of God, cast out devils, Say the kingdom of God is within you. So that means there's something about the demonstration of the spirit's power 
that expresses the reality of God's kingdom. There is something about the demonstration of the Spirit's power and nature. There is something about the demonstration of the authority of God on the earth that expresses the reality of the kingdom. Jesus said, if I by the finger of God cast out devils, then the kingdom is with you, it's within you. So the question Nicodemus came to ask is that you carry something, Jesus, that it's not easy to, fab to, to fabricate. You carry something that cannot be mimicked easily. You carry something that you cannot pretend yourself into. You carry something you can't fake. He said, no man can do these things unless God is with him. And we know it even when we will not acknowledge it outward uh, uh, in public. We know it. You see, in the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God is a kingdom of demonstration. It's a kingdom where things must be seen. It's a kingdom where the works of God must be evident. It's a kingdom where the nature of God in you, you can't hide it. When you have it, you have it. You understand what I'm talking about? The kingdom of God is so, is so powerful that when you enter, you know you enter. When you get it, you know you get it. You cannot have the power of God and hope you don't and, and think you don't. No. When you have it, you have it. But enough of powerless Christianity. Things that can be seen as evidence of God's power and presence, what they do is that they announce the arrival of the kingdom. Those who are in the kingdom of God, they do things that show that God is with them. Those who are in the kingdom, they speak as though God is with them. Those who are in the kingdom, they live. And when they live out, people see that God is with them. Praise God. The Bible says that you are the light of the world. So therefore, let your light so shine among men that they will do what? They will see your good works. You can't be in the kingdom and be too quiet. You cannot be in the kingdom and your life is not evident. When you are in the kingdom, your light shines. He says that they will see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. When you are a, a dweller in the kingdom, there will be things around you for which men must glorify God. Men must hear what you say and give glory to God. Therefore, the kingdom of God finds expression in the earth in the demonstration of the Spirit's power and nature. Through the Spirit's gift and spirit fruits. Praise God. Even though some people have emphasized one against the other, both the manifestation of the gift of the Spirit and the manifestation of the fruit of the Spirit demonstrates the kingdom of God. That was the Nicodemus concern. That was what Nicodemus came to ask. There is something different about you. We can't just fake this life. It's too, it's too complicated. There must be God with you. There must be the hand of God in you. There must be something you carry that we don't have. And Jesus said there's no shortcut through it. There's only one way to it. He said unless you are born of water and of the spirit. Unless a man is born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. And unless he's born of water, which is the word of God. Praise God. That water is the word of God. And he says, and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom. You see, the problem today is that people claim, I am born again. But they stop there. When you are born again, what does that mean? You see, unless, you are, you see, when you are saying, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom. So you can see the kingdom, but if you don't go to the next step of being born by the water and the spirit. Is somebody still hearing me today? Unless you are born by water and the spirit. What does it mean to be born by water? That water, I say, is the word of God. In John chapter 15 verse 3, Jesus said, Ye are clean by the words that I speak to you. What does that mean? That means they are washed by that word. Ephesians 5.23 talks about the washing of water through the word. How Jesus, that's how Jesus prepares his bride, his church. Glory to God. Jesus does not stop preparing his bride because they are born again. He continues to prepare them by washing them by the word. Is somebody catching that now? He continues to prepare them by washing them by the word. He said, we are washed by, of, 
of water through the word. And then Titus chapter 3 says, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the spirit. You must understand how the word and the spirit works together to produce a kingdom man in you. The spirit and the word work together in our life to produce a kingdom woman, to produce a kingdom person, to produce a kingdom church. Hallelujah. That's why you have seen a, a, a lopsided believing or lopsided Christianity where some people emphasize the spirit more than the word. And some emphasize the word more than the spirit. Is that correct? So you will see people who say they are for the spirit. And then they become emotionally uh, in error. Emotional exuberance. You see a lot of shouting, a lot of crying, a lot of expressions of emotions without the word. And then you see also those who say they emphasize the word more than the spirit and what you see is intellectualism dead intellectualism that does not give life to nothing so in Titus the Bible talks about the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit what does that mean when you are regenerated what happens is that you when you, when you by faith confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, what happens is that your spirit is saved. Praise God. Your spirit is saved. Your spirit came alive, which was dead. But that was justification in Romans chapter 5. It talks about having been justified by faith. We have access to this grace. Glory to God. So what happens is justification. And what I'm explaining today is the three stages of salvation that we have to go through. Glory to God. When you confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, what happened to you is that your spirit is saved. Somebody say, my spirit is saved. My spirit is saved. That's justification. You are no longer under the condemnation of sin. You are justified. You are not going to be punished for any sin whatsoever because you are now justified. Your spirit is set free at that point. So justification is an instant salvation for the spirit. Whereas the Bible says in, in that Titus chapter 3. Let us read Titus chapter 3 to give you an understanding of what I'm talking about today. Glory to Jesus. Titus chapter 3. Thank you Lord Jesus. Let us read. From verse, I love to read almost uh, the whole scripture. But let's start from verse 3. He said, For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. He said, But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared. What did he do? Verse 5. He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Praise God. So how does he save us? He saves us by the washing of regeneration through the word. It is by the word you are regenerated. What that does is that it regenes you. It recreates you. Praise God. That's why the Bible says, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation, a creature. You are a new creature, a new kind of being, a new species. Because your gene has been re-engineered. <laughs> to use modern terms. Praise God. Your gene has been changed. You have a new DNA in you. You don't talk like you used to talk. So you don't have to behave like your natural father anymore. Amen. Because now you have a spiritual father. Somebody say, I have a spiritual father. Somebody say, I have a spiritual DNA. So when you speak now, you should not speak like your dad. You should speak like your father who is in heaven. So don't, don't give us the excuse like, oh, that's how they say it in our family. I think you are belonging now to a new family because you have been regenerated. <clears throat> that 
that's what God does to you. <clears throat> so when he saved us, the Bible says he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Praise God. So the renewing of the Holy Spirit means that the Holy Spirit in you has come to continue to renew your mind. To reset your mind. We have talked about that during our Bible study. To reset your mind. Because you have been programmed in the wrong way. You have been programmed in a way contrary to the patterns of the kingdom. You have been shaped by the school system. For real. You have been shaped by the media. When God looks at you, he's wondering where you are from. Because this is not the way he made you to be. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Because of our fallen nature, we begin. To, we had a new teacher. Wrong teachers. So they schooled us in the wrong systems of things, of thinking, of response to life, and every situation that comes our way. Praise God. But now God says we can still salvage that. So he says, let's redeem them. So the purpose of redemption is so that not only that your spirit will be alive, because now, when your spirit becomes came alive, you are justified, what happened is that you have access. Somebody say you have access. Have access. <coughs> Somebody say I have access. access. Somebody say I have access. have access. When your spirit came alive, now you can talk to God and God can hear. Now God can speak and you can carry, you can cut the intel, like we are talking about this morning. God speaks, now you can cut the intel. There are information now being released from the school of heaven, not your earthly school anymore. It's different from what you were taught in school, but this is you. You can catch it. You can learn now. You have been enrolled in the school of wisdom. Praise God. Because now you can understand their language. That's why when you got born again, God gave you a new tongue. You speak in a new language. It's heavenly. Glory to God. Because now there can be a communication between you and God. But that's not where God is bringing you. He gave you his spirit so that the spirit can now achieve renewing in your life. The renewing of your mind. Praise God. Now look at that Titus once more. It says, and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Everybody look at verse 7 with me. It says, so that being justified by his grace, we might do what? We might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Now watch this. Let's think in terms of past tense, present tense, and future tense. Is somebody with me now? So we have been saved according to this scripture, true or false? Is that present or past tense? Past tense. We have been saved by the renewing, by the regeneration, washing of regeneration, and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. Amen? But now, what is it that we are yet to accomplish in this scripture? Verse 7. It says, so that being justified. Being justified means that a completed past tense. You know, it's a, it's a, they call it a past participle. Or the, the, the being justified does not mean that it's a continuous experience. It means that having been justified. That's what is a, is a completed one in the past. Okay? Praise God. And so having been justified by grace, so what is the future thing that will happen? We might become. Praise God. We will be made. Glory to God. So that we should be made. That's the one that has not yet happened. And you got to hold it. Amen? Amen. You got to become it. So to become heirs means that you come into a point where everything that is God's becomes yours. Everything Christ has access to becomes yours. You become co-inheritor. Hallelujah. Co-inheritor of power, dominion, and authority. Co-inheritor of the old essence of God. The old nature of God. Hallelujah. You see, where God is taking you is more than just make you save, get you out of the street and bring you to church. No, he wants to bring you into the kingdom. Don't stop at the church level. You've got to press in into the kingdom level. Because there is so much more in God. And God says, for you to be able to attain this, you need the water and the spirit. To be born by the water and the spirit means that you've got to engage yourself with the word of God and with the spirit.
Spirit of God. So let me say to you that the kingdom is not a place to learn about. The kingdom is a place to enter into. The kingdom is not a place to learn about. Many of us carry the map of the kingdom, but we don't go there. You can know your way to somewhere, but you've never been there because you carry your map around. So the kingdom of God is not a place to just study about. It's a place to walk in. It's a place to live in. It's an atmosphere. It's a sphere of God's rule in and through the hearts of men. It must be an experience. Glory to God. So the sanctification experience is to bring you there. That sanctification experience is not instant. Just like the justification experience. So you are justified. Your spirit is justified. Your soul is sanctified. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. But that's not an instant experience. It is an experience that deals with the salvation of your soul. First Peter chapter 1, I think verse 9 says that, Therefore receiving the goal of your faith, that is the salvation of your soul, so you, your spirit is saved, but your soul is being saved. Glory to God. Your soul, God is after your soul. The reason why you have your spirit, the spirit of God in you, is so that your soul may be saved. The renewing of your mind may now help you to be transformed to the image that God intends. So the work is not done. The fact that you are born again doesn't mean the work is all done. The work has just started. God has just given you grace so that everything you need to be everything God wants you to be, now you have access to it. So you have no excuse whatsoever to not carry the weight of the glory of God that awaits you. The things that God has called yours, the possession he has put your name to, you can walk in them. Praise God. Is somebody ready to enter in? Because there is a door. And the key for entry into that kingdom is by the spirit and the word. People tried, like I said, have to try to have more engagement with one than the other and they throw themselves out of balance. Because every time you emphasize the spirit against the word, you throw yourself out of balance. Somebody say imbalance. Every time you try to emphasize the spirit without the word, you are out of balance. Spirit without the word will lead to mere emotional exhaustion. Word without the spirit will lead to powerless and empty intellectualism. It's like having a big body with a small head. Which one do you prefer? Or a big head with a small body? I believe you don't want any. You want the balance. <laughs> Glory to God. Because either way you know something is wrong. So when you have the, the spirit without the word, your body is big, but you have a small head. But when you have the word without the spirit, your head is big, but your body is small. I think you are still sick. Praise God. Somebody say balance. So how you engage the word and your relationship with the spirit determines your access into the deeper realms of God's kingdom. Somebody say, I'm ready. Now, let's go to Luke chapter 13 that was read to us. One of the scary scriptures in the Bible. And I didn't bring it up to scare you, but to encourage somebody today. So that you will stop being outside of the door. You will enter before the door is shut. Because there is a time that God is going to shut that door. <clears throat> a man came to Jesus while he was teaching, going on his way to Jerusalem. The Bible says the man asked him, will there be few that will be saved? And the way Jesus answered him, it seems that Jesus said, well, I'm not counting. Whether it's going to be few or not is not a big question to ask. The question is, will you go there? The question is not whether how many people are going to be saved. I know people go into this debate as to, are there going to be 144,000 that will be saved? Are we going to live in heaven or we're going to live in the earth? All of these questions, Jesus is saying to us, you make sure you are saved. And how will you do that? I'm not just counting, I'm counting on you that you will do what you must in order that you will enter through the narrow door. Jesus says, strive to enter through the narrow way. So for many I say to you, will seek to enter but will not be able. There is only one door into the kingdom and that door is narrow. Somebody say the door is narrow. Because again, the Christianity today makes it feel as if that door has been expanded at some point. It looks like everybody is Christian now. 
It looks as if that door is no longer narrow. It looks like that door can contain and permit anything and anyone. But I don't think so. I think the door is still narrow. But Jesus said, many, I tell you, will seek to. So what I find that is many today is those who seek to, not those who strive to. So Jesus said, you strive to enter in by the narrow way, because many will seek to. And unfortunately, you see, the church today have been watered down to the taste of those who seek to. A lot of people seek to. You see, the difference between seeking to and striving to, you know the difference. You can have a desire to do something, but if it is too hard, what do you do? You quit. You have a desire to cook, but if it takes a long time to do it, what do you do? You just go for the easier one. You do the Indomies, or the Garis, or the easy to cook, and just microwave it and let it, let's, let's go. So you seek to, you will seek to have the delicious meal, but it takes a long time. It's too laborious for you, so you don't strive to. The difference between that is that today we have a lot of seekers and we have very few strivers. So the question is, are you a seeker or are you a striver? Do you strive beyond just seeking, beyond just desiring to know God more? Do you just say, I want to know God more? Or do you go the extra length, the extra effort to know him Come what may. Are you willing to pay the price when it's hard to know God more? Are you willing to pay the price for an intimate relationship with God? Are you willing to stay there until the door is open? The Bible says, knock and the door shall be open. You have a promise from God. He says, if you stay there and knock, the truth is that the door will be open. But are you going to only wish that it is open or you are going to wait until it is open? Are you willing to go all the way to enter into the kingdom and say, Lord, I'm not going to just stay on the surface. If there is any depth to go, I want to go deeper with you. If there is any height to go, I want to go higher with you. Again, the door is narrow, but the kingdom is not narrow. How many of you know that the kingdom is not narrow? Jesus said, in my father's house, there are what? There are many mansions. The only thing you will have to strive through is to enter in. Because once you enter in, life is easy on that side. Because there, there is power. There, there is authority. There, there is blessing. There, there is joy. The Bible says in the presence of God, there is fullness of joy. But are you willing to pay the price for the glory in the house? Or are you satisfied locking around the house? Strive. You will have to strive to enter. You can't stroll into it unconsciously. When you enter, you will know that you've made it. Jesus said, many will seek to, but they will not be able to. Many have the desire and the will to enter, but it's not the same as entering. You may love a car, but you may never drive the car. You may know about the car, but you may never enter the car. Is that correct? So many have the map into the kingdom and they don't live in it. Many seek, but they won't strive to. They give up because of the cost and the strain it involves. They are so close to the door, but they never put in the extra effort. They never put in the sacrifice it takes. They never give away and give up the things it takes for them to have the door open unto them. They knock, but not long enough. They lock, they knock, but not long enough until the door is open. Jesus said, I tell you, Say, but when once the master of the house gets up, what is he going to do? He's going to shut the door. Somebody says he's going to shut the door. Shut the door. There is a season of time when God is going to get the door shut. Then now you want to strive to enter, but you will not be able to enter more, anymore. Say, but when the master of the house already gets up and shuts the door, he said nobody can come in anymore. And look at the excuse they will give. Very beautiful excuses beautiful excuses. They said they will come and begin to stand without. And may that not be you in the name of Jesus. Amen. I say may that not be you in the name of Amen. Jesus. That is why it is important for you to be all legs in. All body inside. Spirit, soul and body saved. 
Not just spirit saved, but is still wandering around. Not just spirit saved, the soul is still wandering around. You cannot continue to dwell where the disciples were and said, the, 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 the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. You want to be willing, spirit, soul, and body. Glory to God. Because a time is going to come, you are going to want what is available now so badly, but it will not be given to you. That's what Jesus is saying. You will want the access so bad, you will want to do anything it takes at that point, but it will not be able. You will not be able to. The Bible says, Seek ye the Lord when he may be found. Seek the Lord when he may be found. Praise God. Now, as I said, they will stand with us and knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. And he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not. Where are you from? You don't look like somebody from here. You don't look like somebody from the kingdom. You don't, you don't speak like us. You don't look like us. You don't think like us. Where are you from? We, we don't know your origin. <coughs> Praise God. So then shall they begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence. Let me ask you, do you only dine and wine in God's presence or do you wine with him or drink with him? He said, I don't know you. So, but we drank in your presence. The problem is that they drank in his presence, they were drunk in his presence, but they were not with him. In Revelation chapter 3 verse 20, Jesus said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Everybody with me? Say, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Say, if any man hears my voice and open the door, what will do? What will he do? Say, I will come in. I will do what? I will eat with him. That's the key. And I will dine with him. He didn't say I will just throw him a party. Because the Christianity today is a Christianity that throws party for people without Jesus. He said, oh, we party in your presence. Say, yo, you party, but I wasn't there. You party, but it was not with me. You had all your fun. You know, it's like the church today. Oh, we, we do our worship, but it wasn't there. We enjoy what we do as if we are worshiping ourselves. He said, you did all of that good thing, but I wasn't involved. It wasn't about me. It was about you. The party you organized, the drinking and the wine, it was about you. It was nothing about me. I didn't do it with you. There was no fellowship. I wasn't there. May you not hear this voice in Jesus' name. May you be all in, in the name of Jesus. Amen. So you can dine and be drunk in his presence, and yet it was not about him. I remember the story of a, of a family. I'm not sure if it is a real story or something just brought up to teach a lesson. A two-year-old birthday boy was celebrated, uh, celebrating his birthday. And while they were whining and dining, and there was music everywhere, the little boy strolled out into the backyard and drowned in their pool. And the party was on, and the party was on, until they discovered that the birthday boy was missing. I see a church today who throws party everywhere, but the birthday boy is missing. Jesus, who is supposed to be the center of the occasion, is not there. So that somebody dined and wine in God's presence does not mean that God knows them. Somebody have prosperity. They have this and that other one and have other things, but they don't have it in him, have it with him. Say, I need fellowship, not religion. I need relationship, not religion. But you have thrown all that away. You don't care about it as long as you had something to drink and you had something to eat. You didn't care about whether Jesus was there. Sometimes we do our worship and just worship our worship. We worship our own music. We, we sing unto our own selves as if we are the end receiver of our own music. We pray as if we are the one to whom we are praying to. Praise God forevermore. Praise God forevermore. Somebody said something really funny. I saw a post somewhere. They said, if somebody came to church and said, I didn't like your worship, he said, well, thank God we're worshiping you. Praise God forevermore. It's not supposed to be about you. It's supposed to be about God. Glory to the name of Jesus. So the goal is for him to eat with us and to dine with us. The second excuse was, hey, Jesus, we know you. He said, I don't know you. We know you. 
You taught on our streets. How cool is that? Is Jesus more than a street preacher to you? Is Jesus more than a street preacher to you? Because for me, he is the king of my heart. And I wish he will be the king of your heart, the lover of your soul. He must be more to you than just a tele-evangelist. Can you imagine somebody who tells a tele-evangelist, I know you, you preach on my TV. That's what some people will tell Jesus on that day and say, oh, you taught on our street. Jesus said, well, I don't care about you teaching on your street. I don't know you. The reason why you are coming to tell him that you taught on our street is that you have no teaching in your life to show him. Because that teaching that you had on the street, you left it on the street. It didn't show in you. You didn't carry it away from the street. So oh, you preach in our church. You all say, well, I preach in your church, but you left that message in the church. You didn't carry it with you. Paul spoke concerning his own people. He said, you are our letters. What that meant is that God wants you to become the word you hear. He doesn't want you to come and say, oh, you taught on our street. You taught on my television. No, he doesn't want you to do that. He wants to be the king of your heart. Praise God. He wants to be the lover of your soul. So the goal is to enter rest. Jesus said, you're striving to enter by the narrow way. He said, because many, I tell you, will, will, will seek to, but they will not be able to strive to enter in by the narrow gate. And then he said, in the kingdom of God, some people will come from the east, from the north, from the west. He said they will recline. Somebody say recline. recline. Or they will sit. At, in the kingdom of God. They will sit. He said, but you, you'll be cast out. You see, this passage is not only talking about the end of age, when everything is over and we enter into heaven and Jesus will say, oh, I don't know, you go into hell. That is there. But that's not all it is about. Praise God. You will see it here. He was talking to the Jews. That look, God is putting something on your table you are not taking. Some people are going to come and you are going to enter and you will be ashamed. Because you will be outside and they will be inside. And the goal that you will miss is that they will sit in the kingdom. It's a posture of rest. God is calling you into rest in his kingdom. God is calling you to enter into his rest. To cease from your own labors. He wants you to experience the rest that is God's own rest. He wants to give you his own rest. He wants to give you his own peace. He wants to give you his own joy. He wants to give you his own life. He wants to put his own agenda in your hand and say, go and fulfill this agenda. This is my purpose for you. This is my plan for you. Praise God. Praise God forevermore. So the question is, do you give up because it is not easy? Do you stop pursuing God because the going gets tough? Do you engage the spirit and the word? Do you submit yourself like Mary did to the spirit and says, I am the Lord's servant. Let it be to me according to your word. Are you allowing the crowd to dictate your pace? If you are looking for the crowd, they will not be through the narrow door. Do you understand that? If you are following the crowd, you will be among the seekers. If you are following what is popular, you will be among those who seek to enter, but you will not be among those who enter. Because those who strive to enter are very few. Praise God. If you are looking for the crowd, you will not be in the midst of those who strive to enter. Because very few will strive to enter. Somebody say, I'll, take, I'll do what it takes. I will give what it costs. I will enter into the kingdom. I will enter into the kingdom. He said, and I love the irony of this. Jesus said in Revelation 3.20, he said, I will knock on your door. Till whoever opens, I will come in and dine with them. And then he said, it's time because it's coming that you are going to come to knock. And I will say, I do not know you. And you'll be saying, but we ate together and we, we, we drank together. So when you did not open the door to me, you probably ate with the pastor. You probably ate with church members. You didn't eat with God. You probably had a lot of fun with all the good things happening in your life, but I wasn't there. Because if I was there, you would not be standing outside. By the time the door is shut, where are you supposed to be? <laughs> you are supposed to be inside already. A time is coming, the door is going to be shut. 
So the question is, where are you? Are you in or are you out? Again, you cannot be in and out at the same time. If your life feels as if you are out and you are not seeing the kingdom glory, kingdom expression in your life, then you need to ask yourself a question. Am I in or am I out? Are you having forms of godliness or do you have God? Does it look like you are hanging around the properties of God but are you inside the house of God? Are you in the kingdom or you are just in church? Let us bow our heads as we pray together. There are doors in the kingdom. That is the door that determines whether you are in or you are out. If you are in, Jesus wants to fellowship with you. If you are in, he wants to wash you by his word. He wants to build you by his word. He wants to renew you. He wants to wash you by the word. If you are in, he wants to fellowship with you by his spirit. Will you pray to God right now? Lord, help me. Lord, help me. Draw me, Lord. Draw me in. I want to be in. I want to be with you. I want to worship you. I want to serve you. I want to fellowship with you. I want to eat with you. I want to be in a bond with you, in union with you. I want to eat everything you have at the table for me. I want to take your offer. Everything you have to offer, including yourself, I want it. I do not want just some. I want all that you have to offer. I will not just give some of me away. I give all of me to it, Lord. I will not only seek. I want to strive. When it involves some strain, I will give it. When it involves a cost and sacrifice, I will do it. Because the strain is only at the door. The strain is not in the kingdom. Because once I get into the kingdom, I will forget all the pains and the strain. Because there is bounty, there is abundance, there is authority and power and glory in the kingdom. Lord, help me. I want to come right into where you are. I want to be where you are. I want to feast with you. I do not want a feast where you are not. I do not want to eat a food that does not bring pleasure to you. I do not want to engage in activities that you have no pleasure in. I do not want the religion that you are not in. it. Lord, I want you and nothing else. I want you and nothing else. If you are here today and the Holy Spirit is saying to you, it's time to come in. I do not know where you are. I do not know who you are. But I want you to be real with God today. It's about you and God. And that day when the door is shut, nobody is going to be there. Your pastor will have to be striving for his own self to enter in. And it has to be you and God. And you have to say, God, I want to be in today. Tomorrow may be too late. I want to be in. I want to enter into the kingdom. I want to secure my eternal destiny beginning now. I want to experience kingdom power starting from here. I want to experience kingdom dominion and presence beginning from here. If that is you, wherever you are, lift your hands to God. Pray to him. Talk to him about you. Say, God, I do not want to tell stories that won't count. I want to enter when I can. There is a time I will want to that I may not be able to. But today is my day. The Bible says today when you hear his voice, it says, harden not your heart as in the day of provocation. Today is your day. Today is your day. You want to say, God, I am entering today, not tomorrow. I want in now. I want in now. I enter in body, soul, and spirit. Oh, thank you, Lord. Lord, bring me in. Hold me by the hand. Let me go in with you. Let me stay with you. So that I will not have to go out anymore. I love this kingdom. I want to be washed by your word. I want to be washed by your word. I want to be regenerated by your word. I want to be renewed by your spirit. So that I can become the heir of God. Thank you mighty God. In Jesus name we have prayed. Amen. Father thank you so much today. And it's our prayer. That everyone and anyone whose heart you are talking at today. And knocking at their door. Help them to open to you. So that you can open to them. Lord, I thank you. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. And the people of God say, Amen.